letting people in. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm just going to be letting people in from the waiting room for two minutes, but it also means that I get the opportunity to basically uh, chew your ear off a little bit. Um, today, welcome to today's event. We're going to be uh, sitting with Richard Singleton to talk about ESG for SMEs. It's time to get prepared. Um, Richard is the Finance and Sustainability Director from our corporate partner, Menzies LLP, uh, and he'll be taking us through uh, the importance of ESG in the credit management and debt collections industry. Um, now, if you wouldn't mind, I will just ask that microphones are obviously muted. Um, Richard takes us through the topic, and that would be great. Uh, if you have any questions at any point in the webinar, you can pop them into the chat. I'll pick them up with Richard at the end. Uh, if there aren't any questions, then we'll conclude the event. Um, now, I think that is enough of me chewing off is I don't want to go on for too long. Um, I'll be in the background letting people in. Uh, there is 40 that have said that they're going to attend today's event. Um, so hopefully they've all received the email like like you guys did. So um, awesome. Off you go, Richard. Thanks and afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Richard Singleton and I'm the Finance Sustainability Director here at Menzies. Um, I look after or I'm a part of our strategic advisory team and I focus mainly these days on, on ESG advisory for, for my clients. So very much around the sort of who, why, what, when and how of, of ESG at the moment. Um, and hopefully hopefully you find this, this webinar interesting. Obviously ESG is a term it's not, I was going to say beginning becoming a term, but it has been feels like it's been around a while now. But it's being used absolutely everywhere at the moment. You know, whether it's the boardroom, tender documents, chats with friends, having a coffee, or down the pub, it's it's all around us and and very much here to stay. Today's presentation has been prepared to hopefully give you some insight and tips and tricks and take back to your workplace, along with uh, a bit of an introduction uh from a basic level so apologies if if some of you do know a lot about ESG already through to through to very much that strategic side of things um I, I'm going to try and keep it to sort of 20-25 minutes uh, apologies if it goes on slightly longer than that and then we'll then we'll uh, have time for questions at the end so certainly not a sales pitch um isn't a warning about the planet getting hotter either this is sort of designed for real business people, those running businesses or helping to run businesses and understand why it may make commercial sense to consider ESG and how it impacts your business, how it can help your business and ultimately grow your business as well. This is uh, very much aimed as SMEs. Um, so I'm mainly going to be ignoring sort of big investors and the ESG securities market, which you may see in the press. And these are the main take key takeaways that I hope you'll benefit from. So sort of how to start, what to think about, things to look out for, uh, a touch on the accreditation side of things. It's B Corp month at the moment, and I'll, I'll mention that, how it can improve your business, which I think is, is perhaps ignored a lot of the time, but mainly also understanding the threats to your business if delayed. And I think that that one is probably the key that I want to highlight today. So apologies, and I said, uh, depending on how, who, who's aware of ESG or not, but let me just run through in some brief detail. So ESG, so environmental, very much the impact on nature. This can have two, two angles to it, really. It can be how your business is impacting nature, but also how the changing planet is impacting your business. So as I said there, it's everyone's problem now. And actually, it depends what you are and what you do to, to how, how much impact you have. Social, um, very much the probably the the depend again depends on the type of business you are, but assuming you employ people, social cannot be ignored. Um, and as I've said, they're improving equity in people's lives, and still very much. And we, we're trying to not use the P word anymore, but on the heels of a pandemic that really did alter the fabric of society, and I think we've come out the back end of that pandemic with with very much a social focus, and then governance. Um, seems to be forgotten um, but certainly not a new thing it's probably out of the shadows is a good way to describe it and that's around ethics and corporate governance so environmental um, these three categories keep expanding but to keep it basic you know this is what the environmental piece includes um, and it does include a lot more than this trust me it includes GHG emissions, so greenhouse gases, can include air quality, water, waste, energy management, ecological impacts, and climate impacts. 
It's important to note that a full ESG review into your company will look at something called double materiality. And as I mentioned a minute ago, this is where we look at the, the effect climate change is having on your business, as well as the impact your business is having on the planet. It's an inside out and outside in view, if you like. Now, companies and countries talk about net zero, therefore relevant to us to, for me to spend a couple of seconds talking about it. It's a term that gets confused a little bit with carbon neutral, so I'll clear that up for you quickly. But net zero plans must be consistent with something called the 1.5 degree temperature rise that we all hear about and must consider supply chain and everything in that fuller value chain. What is also confusing is, is, that, is that difference between the net zero and carbon neutrality. Probably something you may see every day, whether in the press, on the side of a bus, food packaging, in your fridge. Well, net zero is reducing emissions to the lowest possible point and then removing residual emissions via greenhouse gas removals, if you like, something called decarbonisation. The difference between carbon neutral is carbon neutrality allows you to offset those emissions equal, equivalent to the total carbon footprint without any reduction. So as much as carbon neutrality is a good thing, it can be um, taken in the wrong way. And actually, it, businesses that have, have the cash to do so can just buy offsets. So that's why carbon neutrality gets so much criticism. However, don't let that put you off. Some companies actually start with that as a baseline and then work towards net zero. So it's all about balance. For me, it's all about communication with integrity and understanding what you're investing in. It's pretty much there and obvious, but there are th things called the scopes that I just want to touch on quickly. Um, and anyone in a business that are measuring emissions in some shape or form will come across these three scopes. So scope one is, is gas and petrol of any owned vehicles. Scope two is electricity. So again, just can be electricity in your warehouse, your office, wherever. And scope three is basically everything else. It's a catch-all. And that's why scope three is so complicated and large. And it's the one where most people struggle. It's also likely to be probably 80, 90% of the rest of the emissions that you've got or all of your emissions if you take it. There's been uh, articles recently on something called scope four, which I haven't touched on because it's still developmental uh, but scope four is all to do with avoided emissions so these companies that are actually doing doing good and doing the right thing but it's not necessarily shown when you're measuring it so again an interesting concept and as i said it's constantly evolving this world so it's social um Arguably the biggest topic, actually, and the one which most people are quite nervous about is probably fair, especially if you're running a business. However, if you if you employ people, which are, or or having have colleagues or employees, I'm sure most of you do, it must be considered. So as you can see there, it covers everything from human rights, health and safety, training, DNI, equity, equality, uh, can be things like living wage, gender pay, employee engagement staff welfare and and charity or csr really um csr is an interest one and i get a lot of questions about csr but effectively csr which has obviously been around a very long time has effectively just been sucked up into esg and, and forms part of that wider banner i'd say probably culture it may be the word missing here but um i like to think it encompasses all of the above if you can get the culture right your business will thrive ultimately this again will evolve just like the environmental side and we'll see how things have changed so much since the beginning of the pandemic. Companies' reputations can be brought down in a matter of minutes by, via social media, for example. The obvious example here is, is someone like BrewDog. Um, Google the story if you're interested, but you know, doing fantastic or supposedly fantastic things environmentally, then they get brought down by bullying claims. So it's, it's, it's very dangerous um, out there in the wider world, especially for those larger businesses. Not much to say on this slide, actually, but a term you hear a lot, and I thought it's worth just, just clearing up what it is. So actually, I thought I'd use a phrase that, um, is that a famous quote that's written by someone called Werner Myers. Diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And equity is being allowed to choose the music. So it's very much that, that 
what is it that you're you're doing in your business are you are you just inviting people in how are you treating them are you giving them a voice are you adapting things to to help them and that can be anything from uh disabilities to age anything that's in protect the protected characteristics governance so lastly governance uh, it's probably not the most interesting one for a lot of people but um it's very much there um and actually people are talking about governance like it's something new it isn't um and everything on this slide here has been around probably forever really for, for certainly a very long time and the difference now is that companies are having to be more accountable and transparent which I think you'd argue is not certainly not a bad thing. Whatever your size business is, good governance is going to help. For example, even simple things such improving financial information that isn't good enough, um, which allows then your board to make better informed decisions. Cybersecurity and monitoring data breaches is part of good governance, for example. Good corporate governance is about effectively supervising the management of a company to uphold the company's integrity, achieve more open and rigorous procedures and ensure legal compliance ultimately. It should promote good relations with stakeholders, including shareholders, employees and so on. So as you can see there, it includes things such as risk management, disclosure, executive pay, probably slightly less relevant for smaller companies, ethics, anti-corruption, standards, values, performance management, reporting and taxations. I mean, it can be as simple as how quickly am I paying my suppliers it can be part of good governance. So ESG has rapidly become a key factor for businesses to adopt and embrace. Um, we believe certainly that ESG combined with a strong financial focus and that commerciality will de deliver the results and growth for a sustainable future. With ESG at the heart of your business, it's been proven that your, that your firm, your business will benefit from those, those benefits you can see there. Improved financial performance, you know, ultimately strong ESG strategies are going to attract socially environmental customers, investors. Um, it can help access to capital and so on. Reputation is, is, is obvious if you do it the right way. It can reduce risk ultimately something that I focus on a lot with my clients, looking at that supply chain management, um, labor practices, regulatory fines, and so on. Increased innovation can come with it. Better data, certainly those non-financial KPIs or even sometimes financial KPIs that come along can help make better, better informed decisions. The obvious one, the impact of society and the environment uh, by prioritizing sustainability, ethics, transparency, companies will obviously contribute to a more equitable and sustainable future. I'll come back to the, the next one there, but attracting and retaining employees was certainly something that our companies were looking at very much last year when we had the sort of great resignation and that sort of thing. It was becoming quite obvious that um, employees and certainly talent of today expect a lot more from their employers, prospective employers, and, and employ um, companies are being held a lot more accountable to what they're doing, you know, the benefits they give, but also the culture, um, how they deal with diversity, inclusion, and so on. The one that I do want to highlight there um, that is becoming very, very important at the moment is meeting customer expectations. So assuming a lot of you work in SMEs at the moment, you will probably, and assuming if you're a, if you're a B2B business, you will probably have some very large companies that you that you have as customers or clients. Now, what I'm certainly seeing in my world is those smaller companies being in the supply chain of very, very large businesses are starting to get quite a lot of pressure. Pressure to answer questionnaires, pressure to provide KPIs, pressure to, uh, you know, whether it's, do you have a net zero policy or, or what's your stance on diverse inclusion? Do you have a policy for this? Blah, blah, blah. Whatever it might be, but it's putting a lot of pressure down on the SMEs that are that can't afford to lose those contracts. So that's something very much to be aware of. Probably sits more in the threat element of that sort of SWAT. But obviously, once you're on, on top of it, you've got those KPIs running, then obviously there's an opportunity to uh, transact with more customers um, but can become a bit of a... Uh, competitive advantage. So it's all well and good having the theory, all the benefits, but actually in the real world, how can this help me? Well, I don't think there's a company that exists today that hasn't benefited in some way from reviewing their ESG strategy. 
However, in the first instance, it doesn't it doesn't really need to be a huge undertaking. People assume that because they hear about it in the press and and very very large sort of FTSE companies or global companies talking about it, that their their SME that they work in can't 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 look at it, can't tackle it. But actually, it's worth thinking about just these questions. I think somewhere just if it helps, just to start something as simple as a staff survey can be a good way to start. So you know, ultimately, what in, what information do you receive? What can you measure? Uh, do you know where the pressure is coming from? What's the long term goal? How can ESG help? How can it link with your business strategy? How would you define your purpose, values, culture, and strategy? Now, there are threats and they will be coming. However, just because it's everywhere, it doesn't mean that ESG is going to kill off your business tomorrow. You know, there's a lot of doom mongering, but it's about understanding where those threats may come from and when. For example, a common one we see is that companies could start losing out on tenders, as I said, because that's not measuring those key ESG KPIs. Competition could put pressure on a company to act. Um, I was dealing with a, a client yesterday who actually don't think they need to be doing a huge amount, but their main competitors are doing a lot. Therefore, it's forcing them to do it. Staff, obviously another driver, future products, development, commercial threats, organizational threats. You know, is your system, are your systems fit for purpose? Um, and moral threats, ultimately, are we doing the right thing? I think opportunities get missed a lot here. You know, if you're a business where you can capitalize on making your products more environmentally friendly, for example, then then that's great. But for a lot of businesses out there, there may not be that commercial opportunity. However, you know, I think there are always opportunities to improve process, innovations, communications, um, and there may well be some areas to reduce costs and increase revenue ultimately. The obvious one missing here is the impact on staff and future employees. Another thing to mention that I haven't so far really is that every company is different. Every industry, sector, size, we all have very different ESG strategies and most will be on a very different starting point. What we've started to find by speaking to a lot of clients over the last six months is most companies are doing more than they think they're doing. And therefore, a lot of the time, it's just getting, getting pen to paper really on a lot of this. So where do we start? You know, if it helps. Um, as I mentioned, I think every, you know, every company is different. The markets they're in, challenges they're facing, whether you're B2C, B2B, so on and so forth. Companies and consumers don't really want to deal with companies that aren't doing the right thing anymore. I think that's fair to say. Now, a lot of people could argue that price still comes in, and I think we're, we're, on, a, we're on a transition still. Certainly, the cost of living crisis, um, higher interest rates, price still very much comes into it. A strong ESG strategy relies on challenging the status quo, though, ultimately, and attempting to break that we've always done it this way mentality. Successful companies are usually those that can adapt and evolve quickly, again, seen through the pandemic. There's power in diversity and diverse thinking. Use people around your company, talk to stakeholders and get engagement. Stop and take note, ultimately. Can ESG help challenges that have been there for years? An important point to note is if you're planning on selling, that will affect it. And if anything, should ramp up your efforts. I'm not going to focus on regulations too much today, but happy to have a follow-up call if anyone wants to, to discuss. But unless you're in a huge business, they're unle unlikely to affect you at this point. Things such as gender pay reporting may do, though if you turn out, sorry, if you employ over 250 staff. So where to start? I think take, take a step back, understand your business, challenges, strategy. You know, none of this is new. It's just, it's applying it with an ESG mindset really is what we're doing. Regulation complex and so on. So I wanted to mention stakeholders because I think what certainly has happened and speaking to quite a few financial uh, finance directors recently is that actually reporting has changed a lot. You know, it very much used to be we report for the shareholders. It's all about either share price, dividends, profit, whatever it might have been, depending on the size of the business. However, stakeholders are just becoming more and more important. You know, maybe you've never really had to sit back and consider them. You'll know exactly who they are because you work in the business every day. But they're potentially becoming very important from an ESG point of view. You know, B2B, supply chains, really important. And contracts, you know, 
they may be resting upon proven sustainability credentials. And please, if anything from today, take that back to your businesses. Think about your supply chain and what may be coming down the line. And if you can, how you would be able to answer a questionnaire if your, if your contract relied on it. Employees, obviously, are very important stakeholders. Investors, if relevant. Uh, competitors, the wider community, again, becoming really important, especially from that CSR angle. Um, and, you know, again, supply chain pressure. Please don't forget that. Competitors are an interesting one. You know, what are they doing? How does it impact my business? I think, again, you'll all be aware of who your main competitors are, but have you ever had a look? For example, simply, I mean, simple stuff, but have you looked on their website? What are they doing? You know, is there something else we could be doing ourselves? So I've called it the Menzies approach here. This is how I work through with clients, but it's very simple. Um, something I'm just going to whiz through here, but, you know, SWOT analysis, ecosystem reviews, measurement, communication, monitoring. Okay. Effectively here, because I'm not selling to you, it's who have you got in your business that may be able to take this forward? Ultimately, you need to involve the whole business, but who can take it forward? Don't underestimate the barriers that might affect your business, even those down to attitudes, cash flow, everything should be considered. You know, barriers are really interesting one here. You know, lack of clarity can be a barrier, ineffective change communication, strategic shortcomings, change resistant culture. There can be loads of it. So, and as you can see there, I think business area, then the quick wins, frameworks, timelines, end goal and don't don't let the fear of that long term stop you from from starting so as an accountant myself you know we do like numbers and measuring things but ultimately you can have the best intentions but unless you can establish a proper baseline of what your company does today and put some improvement targets in place you'll never make that progress there may be there are many more um, but to give you some examples there, you can see the type of things that I would I would probably be starting with. And again, every company is different. It may be that you want to focus fully on environmental at the moment and actually social and governance are slightly less relevant in the short term. The, the benefit for SMEs at the moment, unless they're getting that so supply chain pressure, is that you can tailor it however you want. You can create your own framework and you, knowing your business, you'll be able to tailor it to what's important. So many businesses sitting back thinking ESG is a bit of a necessary evil, something that needs to sit separately on the board agenda. That is ultimately wrong these days. Um, but I think in the real world, it's very much comes back to a concept of, of the three P's, which has been around a long time, but it's people, planet, profit. You know, every business out there, especially SMEs, still need to be out there making money. Otherwise, they won't be in business. Obviously, it takes time to build this into our businesses, but when I'm working with my clients, for example, I don't believe that a focus on ESG should ne negatively impact profit, for example, and actually, if done correctly, will only help the bottom line. Now, I'm not going to mention all of the regulations, um, but as you can see there, there's no, no, it's not, it's, um, it's fairly obvious why people get quite confused, you know, it's a bit of an alphabet soup. Um, I think the main things is, you know, please, please speak to me um, at another time if you want to understand a bit more, but a lot of these are very large global regulations. You know, you've got the Sustainable Development Goals, for example, these are the UN's 17 goals that they've brought in. Now, again, very difficult for SMEs to bring this in and make this relevant for your business. It does provide a good framework, um, to provide strategy and a lot of companies follow it. The key for me, however, is recognizing that not all these will be applicable ultimately. So as I said, I, I want to mention B Corp briefly. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot, as I've put there, there's a lot of noise around it. You may be some people uh, listening today that, have, that are part of B Corp or have the B Corp accreditation. Uh, it's, it, are, it describes itself as, as a, a band, if you like, of businesses that meet the highest standards of verified social and environmental performance, public transparency and legal accountability. It's basically a good ESG company. Again, I'm not an advocate for any anything like this, and I try and stay fairly neutral on it. But again, please have a look if you think it might be something that helps your business. So I realize this is quite a big quote, but it's very important actually at the moment. Communication is key and needs to be done with integrity and should be done both internally and externally. 
Marketing is an incredibly powerful tool, as we know, and there's no doubt it can take blame for some of the current environmental and social issues. So the message here is really think before you communicate. Is it legitimate? If we were to be audited, could we hold it up? Are we actually doing this stuff? You know, greenwashing isn't a, a term I've used yet today, but obviously it gets used or gets a lot of airtime at the moment. All I can say is be careful, but don't let it stop you. Too many companies are now showing green hush ultimately, doing the right thing, but being afraid to talk about it for fear of criticism. So I have just a few final slides here because I did promise you I'd only be sort of 20, 30 minutes. But again, I'm going back to my roots, certainly, you know, ESG can really improve or impact certainly your financial performance. R&D, capital allowances can obviously help and can form a part of the cash benefit of ESG. But just be aware, you know, if you think about it from a financial point of view, there may be some threats, some opportunities to go for. Have a look at the, at the above. Something I've heard actually recently, so I wanted to put a slide in, do SMEs need governance? Well, yes is the short answer. As it said above, it reduces risk, increases confidence in crucial stakeholders. When looking at exit plans, for example, ESG will make your business more valuable. But again, please remember, it can be tailored to who you are and what you do. It doesn't need to be one approach for everyone. Risk management's key. Just think about your payment process as an example. So just to leave you with a few tips and tricks today, just start, don't be overwhelmed. Remember, you know your business inside and out and it's likely you're doing some brilliant things already that can now be encompassed by that ESG banner. You know, ultimately progress is better than perfection as I've said there. Think about short-term, long-term, not everything needs to be done tomorrow. Get the basics right, not understand where you need to start and keep it simple. Consider that state wider stakeholders, who's interested, where the pressure's coming from. Double materiality may come into it. Don't overcompete. Again, get the basics right and plan before any action. So thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Um, and obviously a time now if, if there are any questions. Perfect. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, that was a really informative uh, session. Um, I've been keeping an eye on chat and there's been no questions. So I'm just going to once again, chew people's ears off now. Uh, so that there is a little bit of time to submit a question if you want. Um, and it gives me an opportunity to basically tell everyone that um, if you've missed parts of this event or you want to go back on things, all of our virtual events are recorded and they'll be added to the CRCM resource uh, area along with a nice little write up so that, you know, you can improve uh, accessibility for you there as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. So unless there's any questions and you, you can feel free to unmute uh, and cut me up, that's totally fine. Um, but other than that, I think that's a wrap. So thank you very much again, Richard.